Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 100 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and uh, for this week we're going to be doing something a little bit different uh, to celebrate our 100th show. Um, we're, uh, and the fact that this is the first full day of spring on which this is being done, we're going to celebrate there's not going to be any ranting denunciations of the evilness in the world. Instead, it's all going to be good stuff. We got some good news, we got a couple of hero awards, and we got some cool science stuff under our occasional feature called And Another Thing. Uh, but if you do have any reactions to the show, as always, whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here somewhere a couple of times during the show you can get the email address from there please just remember to put um, your cable show or left side of the aisle something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam and be a little patient because I do answer my mail but I can be a little slow about it all right with that oh by the way something else just before I get started there are a couple of things that would be deserving of discussion this week but they're going to be put off for the sake of our celebration one thing that I'm going to have to talk about, uh, March 19th was the 10th anniversary of the start of the Iraq War. That's something, uh, the Iraq War is something that has to be addressed. Also, there is the matter of the stomach-turning cowardice on the part of the Democratic leadership in the Senate over the issue of guns. Uh, and finally, there is a budget that I have to talk about. It's proposed by the Congressional Progressive Caucus. It may well have already been voted on by the time you see this. Um, it would have been, this is an actual federal budget, which would be regarded as dead on arrival, having no chance of passage. Now, it sharply cuts the deficit, and it does it without going after Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid or any other domestic program. And for that reason, it is regarded as unserious by the pundits and politicos. So that's something else that we need to put aside. But again, we're doing that just to have our little celebration this week, and we'll get back to the other stuff next week. The uh, first thing, this is an area of good news, and it's an area where as I've said before, it seems most of the good news comes from these days. This is the area of same-sex marriage. Uh, according to a study done by Lifeway Research, this is an outfit, a polling outfit, that has connections to the American Baptist Convention. But according to their poll, 64% of American adults believe that approval of same-sex marriage in the U.S. is inevitable. This has nothing to do with whether they approve of it or not. It has to do with whether or not they think it's going to happen. And the thing is, those people are right. They are very likely right. Increasing numbers of people do support the right of same-sex couples to marry. On March 18th, an ABC News Washington Post poll stated that 58% of American adults approve of same-sex marriage. This is an all-time high. It's a little higher than some other polls, but they tend to run in 52-53% majority, majority support. In this particular poll, they said 58% approved, only 36% disapproved. That is almost a 180-degree turnaround from just 10 years before. The poll found, as you would expect, I think, large majorities of both Democrats and independents support same-sex marriage. The interesting thing was that even among Republicans, a, major, a small majority, small majority, but a majority of Republicans under 50 supported the right of same-sex couples to marry. Nine states in the District of Columbia presently recognize same-sex marriage. Eleven more states have some form of civil union or domestic partnership. The Illinois Senate recently passed a bill uh, to allow for same-sex marriage in Illinois. The prospects for the ultimate passage of this are regarded as good. In Minnesota, bills for this same purpose have passed out of committees in both the State House and the State Senate. They're awaiting floor votes. There's still a fight ahead, but sponsors say they're confident of passage. And the governor, Governor Mark Dayton is his name, he's already said he will sign such a bill if it gets to him. Now, a couple of quick footnotes to this bit of good news. One, the uh, Green Street United Methodist Church of Winston-Salem, Winston North Carolina, has issued a very dramatic, very moving statement declaring that it will no longer perform straight marriages until same-sex marriage is legal in North Carolina. And two, I keep saying this is an area where we know justice will come. It is going to happen. Uh, why do I keep saying that? 
Well, here's one reason. That same ABC News Washington Post poll I just cited, among people aged 18 to 29, 81% supported the right of same-sex marriage. So all we really have to do is wait for the old fogies to die off. Oh, by the way, the house in the picture that's up here, uh, this house actually sits right across the street from the headquarters of the Westboro Baptist Church. All right, moving on to another area of good news. The Maryland General Assembly has voted to repeal the state's death penalty. The bill now goes to Governor Martin O'Malley, who is sure to sign it because he campaigned for this. The bill didn't come out of nowhere. There have been previous attempts to uh, ban the death penalty. There had been a uh, creation of a commission to study the issue, which recommended a ban, uh, and moves to tighten the requirements for imposing the death penalty. But now, Maryland is doing away with it altogether. Maryland thus will become the 18th state and the sixth state in the last few years to end the death penalty. Um, Connecticut, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, and New Mexico were the other five. Now even so, despite this progress, the United States remains the only advanced Western democracy that refuses to recognize the death penalty as the class and race-based uh, violation of human rights, which it is. I want you to look at this map, okay? Look at this map. Countries marked in blue on this map, and there are a hundred of them, they have eliminated the death penalty. The countries in that sort of ugly greenish color, they only impose the death penalty under extraordinary circumstances like crimes committed in wartime. Those in gold have abolished it in practice. The death penalty may still be on the books, but they have not executed anybody in at least 10 years which leaves those in reddish-brown, including us. And I want you to look at that and look at the other countries in reddish-brown and see who we are aligning ourselves with. We should be ashamed. However, I do want to end. This is good news, so I want to end on an up note. The death penalty is fading away in most of the United States of its own accord. The Death Penalty Information Center says that death sentences in the U.S. have declined by 75% and actual executions by 60% since the 1990s. All right, next up, more good news, or good news at least for some of us. In 1913, the New York Times quoted a medical examiner as describing a particular woman. This is an actual particular individual. Uh, and he, you have to know that this woman he was talking about had um, what would, by, by modern calculations, had a body mass index, or a BMI, of 27. Remember that. Well, he described this woman as perfect and said, quoting, in her physical makeup, there was not a single, uh, uh, single defect. Well, today, a BMI between 25 and 30 is considered overweight. Anything above 30 is considered obese. New research just published in the Journal of the American Medical Association says that they might have had it right in 1913. Researchers, these researchers, analyzed nearly 100 studies involving nearly 3 million people, and uh, they compared mortality rates among different weight classes. Now, there are, three, there are three classes of obesity, class 1, 2, and 3, obviously. Only the highest two classes of obesity, that's with BMIs above 35, actually had a higher rate of mortality. People in the overweight category and in the so-called moderately obese, class 1 obesity, actually had a lower mortality than those in the so-called normal range. In other words, people who are classified today as overweight or moderately obese actually experienced a lower rate of mortality as compared to those in the normal, healthy weight range. The difference wasn't huge, but it was there. All of which goes to prove, again, that despite what we hear, despite what we're told, that being overweight is not itself a health condition. It is not itself a sickness and should not be treated as one. All right, another area of good news. Last week, I mentioned these, these outrageous, these extrajudicial, judici warrantless demands for personal information called National Security Letters, or NSLs. Well, early last year, the FBI sent one of these secret letters to a phone company demanding to turn over certain customer records. 
We don't know what company or what records because the recipient of such a letter is barred from even mentioning that they got it. But the phone company in this case did something almost unheard of. It challenged the letter in court. A 2006 amendment to the so-called Patriot Act, which I actually call the Traitor Act for its effect on our civil liberties and privacy, but the Patriot Act, an amendment to that, specifically allowed for such challenges. Despite this, the Obama administration, which came into office pledging to be the most transparent administration ever in our history, responded with a civil complaint charging that the company, by, by not simply complying and handing over the files, had actually violated federal law by interfering, quote, with the United States' sovereign interest in national security. Now, the whole case gets complex um, and it's shrouded in secrecy. I mean, today, we, we still don't know even what phone company is involved, although um, the Wall Street Journal speculates that the company is working assets, which runs a wireless service called Credo, but we don't know for that. What we do know, this is what we do know, using the 2006 amendment, this company has challenged not only the, the letter, but the constitutionality of the law. It argues that the part of the law that requires it to be silent violates its constitutional right of free speech. The No Justice Department argues not only that the company can't challenge the constitutionality under the amendment, but that it can't challenge the constitutionality at all because the government has what's called sovereign immunity against lawsuits. Now, this is usually applied only to cases where somebody's seeking monetary damages. If it's applied to a case like this, it would in essence say that you cannot challenge the constitutionality of any law unless the executive branch of the federal government chose to allow you to do so. All right, so in the face of all that, what's the good news? On March 14th, U.S. District Judge Susan Ilston in San Francisco struck down sections of this law, the law that allow for national security letters, declaring they suffer from, quote, significant constitutional infirmities, unquote. Now, the downside of this is that she put the decision on hold give the, to give the government uh, time to appeal, and there's a good chance it'll be overturned on appeal because... Well, you know, national security, you know, what do you expect? Of course. But still, combined with an earlier decision by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York that struck down some aspects of national security letters, there is maybe a sign that people and courts are starting to think that maybe the security business has gone too far and are starting to try to claw back some of the ground that we have lost. And that is good news. All right, another thing, another bit of good news. I haven't talked about the Occupy movement much, as, much of late. Um, they're still out there. They don't make the big headlines because most of what the movement's doing is very local-based. So they're not making the big headlines, but they're still out there. But the thing is, a lot of the court cases arising from the, from the uh, early occupations have been winding their way through the courts, and the protesters keep winning. For example, just recently in Philadelphia, a jury acquitted a dozen activists who had been accused of conspiracy and trespassing for holding a sit-in at a Wells Fargo bank. In New York, Michael Primo, this is the first case of Occupy Wall Street that actually got to a jury trial in New York City. Michael Primo was charged with assaulting an officer. He was acquitted after video showed that the cops had lied about the incident and in fact Primo was the victim, not the assailant. In Austin, Austin, Texas, seven members of Occupy Austin were facing felony charges for an, a simple act of peaceful civil disobedience. They had apparently chained themselves to some piping at the Port of Houston. They had their sentences reduced to time already served when it came out that three Austin cops had infiltrated the group and had actually goaded the protesters into doing this. In Chicago, 92 Occupy activists have been arrested in a raid on Grant Park. Their cases were summarily dismissed by Judge Thomas Donnelly, who realized that the so-called curfew law actually was enforced rarely and um, inconsistently. She said, clearly, use of the law here was intended to deny these people their First Amendment rights. And in Cleveland, 
Two activists who were found guilty of staying overnight in a park won a reversal when the State Court of Appeals said that that decision had, um, that verdict had ignored their First Amendment rights. All of these kind of recent successes may be part of what has inspired Occupy Now to undertake a case where it's not the defendant, it's the plaintiff. Uh, what's known as Occupy Wall Street's Brain Trust, Occupy the SEC, has filed a lawsuit against federal regulators of the banking industry. The suit alleges that these regulators, who they name in the suit, have violated the law by failing to enact the Volcker Rule, which was a key component of the 2010 Dodd-Frank Act and restricted what the banks could do. All right, yet another bit of good news. I talked about the Keystone XL pipeline before. This is the pipeline that is supposed to carry tar sands from Alberta to the Gulf Coast. Uh, to refineries there, and tar sands are about the dirtiest, most polluting way to produce heavy oil that there is. Environmentalists and others concerned about the environment and particularly about global warming uh, have been opposed to the project. And now it has a new and rather surprising person expressing real doubts about it, Nancy Pelosi. During a press briefing last week, she said she found it her word amazing that advocates of the project claim it would produce tens of thousands of jobs and reduce our dependence on foreign oil. Quoting her, the oil is for export and the jobs are nowhere near that. You know, it seems that recently I've been saying right on to a lot of unexpected people. First Rand Paul and now Nancy Pelosi. What is the world coming to? We're coming to a break. We'll be back. Here we are, back. There you are, not having left. Uh, so, we got a couple of hero awards for you to come up. Yes, uh, the first one goes to a woman in Bosnia Herzegovina. Now, earlier this month, there, there's a school in, in Mostar in Bosnia Herzegovina. It was established in 2006 for the specific purpose of trying to contribute to the reconstruction of a post conflict society. There are students from about 40 different countries who attend this college. And um, the, early this month, they were having a march through, through Mostar with carrying flags, kind of like, you know, multicultural kind of thing. Well, this uh, young woman, this young Croatian woman, was in the parade, she was holding hands with her Serbian boyfriend. And an old woman on the side demanded to know how she could dare and stand to walk next to a Serb. In response, she kissed him. Uh, a Reddit user with the screen name Evolved Bacteria uh, who took the picture, said it showed, quoting, for us here in Mostar, the new generations are not willing to contribute to a war of minds. Hope springs eternal. All right, our other hero award, very quickly. Last week, I said I was giving a hero award to Bradley Manning. Uh, I wanted to sort of formalize it this week, taking advantage of the fact uh, that uh, an audio recording of the statement that he made to the, uh, to the court martial has been made available to the Freedom of the Press Foundation. They said they don't know who did it or how they did it, but they've got it, they verified its authenticity, and they're releasing it. And a link to this will be at my website. You've got to realize the restrictions that have been going on with this trial. Um, you can't make any video recordings, you can't make any audio recordings, you can't even take a picture of Bradley Manning, and you can't get a transcript of what's going on. This actually is our first chance, first chance ever, to hear Bradley Manning in his own voice. Use it. All right, for the rest of the show, we're going to go to some cool science stuff. Uh, and another thing, this is called. And the first two are actually sort of, they're sort of hybrids of good news and, and another thing. So we're going to start at Lima, Peru. Now, Lima, you probably didn't know this, or at least I didn't know this. Uh, Lima, Peru is on a desert. In fact, it's the second largest capital city in the world that's on a desert. It gets about a half of inch of rain, of rain a year. In fact, the nation of Peru averages about two inches of rain a year. So fresh water is always a problem. It's always a consideration. All right, the billboard in this picture is an answer to that question. 
It was designed by folks at Peru's University of Technology and Engineering, and it takes advantage of the fact that the local humidity is about 98%, and it uses reverse osmosis to literally suck the water out of the air, and at the bottom provides a tap with pure, clean water. In its first three months of operation, it has produced nearly uh, 9,500 liters, that's about 2,500 gallons of pure, clean water, enough, according to the university, to meet the monthly needs of hundreds of families. Some folks are now hoping to even have uh, uh, something like this in, like, in every village. And it could hardly have come at a better time. See, people in Peru depend upon the yearly melt from Andean glaciers for their water supply. And as a result of global warming, those glaciers have shrunk by 30 to 50 percent since the 1990s. All right, um, on our other very uh, good news and, uh, and another thing issue, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, has advanced a proposal to create a super Wi-Fi network, a nationwide public Wi-Fi network which would make long-range Wi-Fi available to uh, in almost all urban areas and a lot of rural ones. Now, the problem with this, the technical problem, is that there'd be no one managing this uh, network. So, and especially in urban areas, it could become so congested that traffic would slow to a crawl, kind of like, you know, Route 3 on a Friday summer evening. Um, but if implemented... This would not only bring internet and wireless access into the reach of the of people who cannot currently afford it, for a lot of casual users, it could replace their corporate carrier altogether, which is why, of course, the big wireless companies are against it. They despise the idea and want the government to sell this portion of the spectrum to them instead of releasing it for public use. However, the idea is for free nationwide public Wi-Fi. It seems to me that's the kind of thing that the government should be doing. All right, some cool science stuff. A little bit of cool science stuff. This I, think, this, I think, is really cool. I like this. The 13th century saga, Viking saga of St. Uh, Saint Olaf, refers to sunstones. These were special crystals that the Vikings used to navigate under less than sunny conditions. Now, none have ever been found at any Viking archaeological site, so they have been the source of speculation and myth and whatnot. But now it develops that a crystal that was uncovered in the wreck of an Elizabethan warship that wrecked off the Channel Islands in 1592 may actually say that these crystals were real. Um, a crystal was found less than three feet from navigational instruments in the wreck, which indicates it was stored with them. And chemical analysis has confirmed that it is Icelandic spar, or calcite crystal. Now, Icelandic spar is what's called birefringent. What it means is that if you look through it, you'll see a double image. You may be able to make out the double image in the picture here. But if the crystal is held in just the right position, the image you see becomes a single image. And when that happens, that crystal is pointed east-west. This remains true even in low light, even when it's foggy, even when it's uh, cloudy, even when twilight has come, even when the sun's a little bit below the horizon. Now today, the particular crystal they found will be useless for navigation. It's been abraded, it's been spoiled by salts and so on. But this came at a time when Europeans had not fully mastered the vagaries of using a magnetic compass, and they could have used this kind of crystal like as a backup. Now again, no such crystals have been found at Viking sites, which is... Maybe not surprising, since the Vikings tended to cremate their dead. However, recent excavations have turned up fragments of these crystals at these sites, which means that there were people at these sites who were using these crystals for something. All right, going from there, we're going to head out into space a little bit, very quickly, out to Mars. Uh, you probably heard about this, but an analysis of a rock sample that was recently collected by NASA's Curiosity rover shows ancient Mars could have supported life, maybe microbe life, but life. Michael Meyer, who's a lead scientist for the project, said, and I'm quoting him, a fundamental question for this mission is whether Mars could have supported a habitable environment. From what we know now, the answer is yes. Now, you've got to understand, they didn't find life, okay? And this doesn't mean that there was life on Mars in the past. What it does mean is that the physical and chemical conditions that allow for life did exist on Mars. 
maybe at least in the distant, distant past, but they did exist. All right, from there, we're going to head way out into space, way out into space, 56 million light years from Earth. I want you to imagine a ball more than 2 million miles wide. That's more than eight times the distance of the Earth to the moon. A ball 2 million miles wide, spinning so fast that the speed at its surface approaches the speed of light. Such an object actually exists. The supermassive black hole at the center of spiral galaxy NGC 1365, 56 million light years out there. This is the first time anyone has accurately measured the spin of a supermassive black hole, uh, which is the kind of huge kind of black hole that sits at the center of many galaxies, including the Milky Way, by the way. Now, a black hole is something where there's so much stuff, so much matter compressed into such a small space that the gravity is so great that even light can't escape it. And even light can't escape it. As material spirals in toward the black hole, uh, it accelerates, goes faster and faster and faster, and the friction among the particles becomes so great, generates so much energy that this emits x-rays. What's more, the gravity is so strong that as this black hole spins, it literally drags space-time around with it. It distorts space-time. It's called frame dragging. The point of this is that as a result of this frame dragging, this material can get closer to the black hole before it gets actually sucked in and beyond our, beyond our reach. So seeing, if you can see where the x-rays are coming from, astronomers can actually measure the black hole spin. Why would they go through all this? Well, two reasons. One, if you know a black hole's mass and its spin, you know everything there is to know about it. And a black hole spin, more importantly, gives clues to its past, and by extension, clues to the evolution of the galaxy in which it sits. Knowing the spin of this black hole can tell us something about how galaxies are formed. And it's so one of the cool things about these science where these, you think these odd things, how, how, imagine how you can figure out the history of a galaxy 56 million light years away. This is the time when there were still dinosaurs on Earth. They were still just, the dinosaurs are just disappearing. 56 million light years away. You can look at that and by using instruments, you can actually figure out what's going on at the center of it and what that tells you about the history of that entire galaxy. Meantime, NASA's Kepler mission, I'll tell you this very quickly. Are there Earth-sized planets out there? Yeah, we know there are. We know now of a thousand so-called exoplanets. These are planets outside our solar system, and the Kepler mission has discovered 3,000 more. Earth-sized planets out there in our galaxy, they're common. All right, that's it. That's our celebration. Good news. Here are awards and another thing. We will be back to our ranting denunciations of all things evil next week. So in the meantime, you have the best week you possibly can, and happy 100th to me. Bye.